Good morning. It's hard to believe, but it's the end of July, July 31st. We're reading through the Bible in a year. We've come to Psalm 62, 63, and 64. Those three Psalms are our Psalms of the day, the Davidic Psalms. They all remind us of the humanity of David and the things that he was subject to, a lot like what we're subject to, only a lot worse in many cases. Uh, he has to wait for God. God's not just doing what he wants the minute he wants it. We recognize that the Christian life is going to be filled with waiting. The fruit of the Spirit is to produce that waiting in our life, that patience, we call it, we translate it. Macrothemia, the Greek word in the New Testament there, is that long suffering, that long fuse, the ability to hang in there under pressure. And in this case, even in unanswered prayer for a long time without getting irritated, frustrated, or losing our patience. So we learn a lot from this in the Psalms. We see it throughout the Psalms, one of the many themes of having to learn to wait on the Lord. The next Psalm, Psalm number 63, reminds us of the need for us to see the longing and thirsting for God in our own lives as David had it. That's a work of God's Spirit within us. We don't naturally seek after God. We don't naturally want more of God in our lives. That's a hard thing. It really grates against our flesh. Our flesh doesn't want the accountability. We don't want the knowledge of the Holy One. We'd rather hide like Adam in the garden. But we have to learn like David to see the Spirit of God change our desires, to move toward God, to want to know His Word, to want to know more about Him, and want to love Him more perfectly. So that's what we see in that next Psalm. The third Psalm of the day, Psalm 64, we see all the perils of living in this world, particularly if you're someone like David trying to advance the cause of Christ in your sphere of influence. You're going to find the pushback even as it says in this passage, the plots, uh, the people that are going to sharpen their tongues, so to speak, to uh, shoot their words at you, to do you harm and damage. And this is a reminder that even the most beloved of the characters in Scripture, the man after God's own heart, uh, he's the target of a lot of abuse and a lot of pain is directed his way. And yet he trusts in the Lord and he puts his confidence in God to be his ultimate protector and deliverer. And so ought we. Uh, our great New Testament reading today Today is the beginning of an amazing book of the New Testament, the book of Romans. We see this as, we often call it, we often call it uh, Paul's magnum, uh, magnum opus, uh, his ultimate work, his greatest uh, expression of salvation, 16 chapters, uh, the first eight uh, phenomenal chapters about salvation by faith, that we are uh, justified by faith in Christ alone. And this is a terrific book for us to read carefully and slowly. Even this first chapter is just chock full of good things, this opening paragraph. Uh, talking about the fulfillment of biblical prophecies that all relate to Christ and who he was uh, as a descendant of David, that he would be raised from the dead, that this is a declaration of him being the Son of God, that all of this was revealed ahead of time through the prophets, and that he's not ashamed of the gospel, that it's the power of God into salvation, a great statement of his boldness to be a representative of this message of the gospel. And then the latter part of the chapter, he begins this argument that goes into the second and third chapters of the book that God is, in this case, revealing not just his salvation, which he's going to talk about in chapter four and following, but his wrath. That's the whole reason. That's the motivation for us to be evangelists, to see people's lives saved because the wrath of God is coming justly upon the world. And uh, just as he extends a means of salvation in Christ, he is also uh, sending his judgment. And that is the reality. The cross is the absorption of the penalty that we deserve. And we are calling people to get under that place of safety, so to speak, uh, because the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men, which is not just the consequences of sowing and reaping in this world. It's what's coming when we face God. It's appointed on a man wants to die, the book of Hebrews says, and then comes the judgment. We want to be serious and thoughtful and sober about the coming uh, penalty of sin. And that's why we are seeking people to get right with God. Uh, great chapter. Our Community imperative is found in Romans chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We've been going through 1 Corinthians looking at community imperatives, and this is an interesting one in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses um, 11 and 12. It says, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born out of woman, and all things are from God. And that great picture of God's overarching sovereignty over all things, and that he has made human beings in two genres, two genders, and both of those should be respected from the other position. So depending on your gender, jot it down this way. Humbly respect men. Women, I would say that to you. And men, humbly respect women. That's 
the community imperative. You need to see the distinctions that are made, that God has made between men and women, and no one should have a sense of superiority. We ought to recognize humbly the good and the grace and the glory that God is extending into the world through the opposite gender. So humbly respect men and humbly respect women. That's the position we ought to have in the body of Christ, in our homes, and that's the way we ought to view the world. We recognize the two distinctions in our genders as a gift from God and one that expresses God's greatness in a manifold way, in this case, in two distinct ways.